so much happened today. Flynn's free, and we've got documents dumped all over the place. So stick with me, folks, and we'll talk about all of it. Hey everybody, this is Deb with Truthfication Chronicles, and oh, what a day it's been. Oh my goodness, it's like, turn around and something else comes up on the news feed. Oh my goodness. Okay, so General Flynn has been exonerated, pretty much. I mean, it's not totally official, but it will be. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute, but I wanted to show you this because this was a tweet that he put up, and this is his grandson, Travis. Listen to this. You've got to hear it. Pay very close attention. I think you'll understand what he's saying. I just need to go to black. I need the states of America. I told him my papa neck. Well, what's that stance? The nation. Under God. And the reservoir of liberty. And this is the act. All right, buddy. Oh my gosh, wasn't that the cutest thing under the sun? Oh, it just makes you want to cheer and justice for all. Wow, he did an awesome job. I don't know how old he is, but he's not very old because he was, I think, four months old when they were roughing up uh, Mike Flynn Jr. So, wow, oh, that's just so awesome. Almost brings tears to your eyes. I can't believe he could say it like that. I mean, it took a little bit to understand what he was saying, but once you got it, it was like, oh, wow, he is saying the whole Pledge of Allegiance. Awesome. Awesome job there, kiddo. And we are so glad for your grandpa. Whew. We've been praying for him and everything. But not everybody is really happy about Flynn. And you can see that trending on Twitter, there was a hashtag, Flynn is guilty. And then there was another one, Flynn exonerated. Guess which one was being given prime location and put up as if it were the very first one? Yeah, Flynn is guilty. But look how many tweets it had. 4,719 tweets. Flynn exonerated had 18.9 thousand tweets. And so, yeah, Twitter was messing around with the numbers, trying to make it look like this was the more important one and more people were talking about it. No, 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 no. More people were talking about this one by far. So, yeah, love to see that trending. And I think uh, Sidney Powell even had, what was it, Flindication? <laughs> and flindicated and uh there were just so many different hashtags i've seen and uh katherine herridge from cbs and i know she's on cbs so i don't normally watch it but she's been doing a decent job about some of these things at least she's covering them when a lot of the other mainstream media news outlets won't but uh she had an interview here with attorney general barr and yeah, I don't know how long the actual interview was, but they chopped it up into a bunch of little pieces on uh, YouTube. So if you put in her name and CBS and Bar, you should be able to find them. But there's just several of them. So, uh, I mean, they were like a minute or 30 seconds or I think the longest one I saw was three minutes or well, 240 something. So, yeah, and most of it was pretty decent, but they did do some cutting on one and some of her questions I thought were just not really being very fair. It had a lot of thumbs down on that particular section because she just was coming at it like, well, Flynn is guilty and you're letting him off type thing. And I know that's probably what CBS wanted her to do, but um, it's just not fair. When you look at the actual evidence, the documentation is there. So anyway, this, uh, you know, she was talking about it here. And then um, this is from the court listener. This is the actual case. And when you see this, you can go down and see all the different things that have happened. And it usually goes from the oldest to the newest up here. And so uh, here's you know, the whole thing about it, the motion to dismiss case. I do want to point this out to you. 
if you've been following along or if this is something you like to do, look at all these documents. There are new ones on here. There were some before, but there are new ones now. And I don't know which ones. I can't recall right off which ones are the new ones. So just going to have to make sure I've got them all downloaded on that and look through them because I don't know what they are, but should be some interesting stuff there. I would assume they're things that will exonerate him. I I would think it's the like the Brady material. And then on this one, this right here was interesting. Notice of withdrawal of appearance by USA as to Michael T. Flynn, Van Grack, Brandon. Okay, so I looked at this one and here's what it looks like. And this is a notice of withdrawal. Pursuant to local rule of criminal procedure 44.5E, please notice the withdrawal of Brandon L. Van Grack as counsel for the government in the above caption matter. Huh. So it looks to me like Brandon Van Grack is a uh, bye-bye. So I read somewhere that he had actually, um, you know, quit the DOJ too. I'm not sure about that. Maybe he was fired. I don't know. He should be, he should be disbarred. And I think he probably will be before all this is over. And he may actually probably be in jail for a while. And I, you know, I was looking this up, local rule of criminal procedure 44.5E, and I wanted to see what it was. Found out it just basically is if you're going to have a change of any, um, you know, lawyers, you got to let them know. So that's pretty much what it was. And I'll talk more about this website later where I got this from because uh, very interesting. So anyway, he is no longer there. It's, uh, well, obviously it doesn't matter because it's all going to be dismissed. Now, I don't think technically it has been dismissed at this point, but it's like it's going to be a sure deal. Anyway, uh, there's one last thing, though, I thought was kind of interesting. This up here is a minute order that they're going to make Covington and get together with uh, Sidney Powell and Mike Flynn and they're going to have to resolve something about why Covington and Burling didn't release some of these documents and didn't want to go looking for more and you know because they were really dragging their feet on it so this is kind of interesting there Anyway, so that's it as it goes right now. I thought that was, um, you know, kind of interesting to keep up with that. And I'm a little anxious to look into these. I tell you folks, there's no way I could have looked into all the documents that dropped today because there were probably about 20,000 pages <laughs> that have been released. No, not that many. There's at least 10,000 pages. And so I, there's just no way anybody could have gone through them all at this point, unless you're one of those speed readers. You know, people talk about what superpower you'd like to have. I would love to have the superpower to be able to read things really, really fast and retain them. I think that would be wonderful. Think of all the things you could know about. Oh, anyway, so there were a lot of people talking about this and Sydney Powell took a little bit of a victory lab here, I thought. And so she was talking about Schiff and I like what she says here. Mr. Schiff wouldn't know the truth if it poked him into one of his bug eyes. <laughs> she makes me laugh. Oh, that was great. You have to go down here in the videos here with Lou Dobbs. And it says Sidney Powell gloats. It wasn't really a gloat, but it was a victory lap. So she deserves it. This is a really good video. It's three minutes and 46 seconds. I recommend you watch that one because it was good for it. Um, and by the way, while I'm here and this is over to the side, that salon owner that was supposed to be fined $7,000 for opening her salon and then jailed. I mean, she was jailed. Well, they released her and so they dropped the charges because the state attorney general stepped in and said, this is ridiculous. Let her go. And so she did get to leave. And um, I think she had a GoFundMe account. I mean, I think someone started it for her. She didn't start it. There was supposed to be a lot of money in there last I knew. And Sean Hannity had her on there. And he said at the end of the piece that he was going to give them some money. He was going to help them out. So I thought that was really nice, too. Anyway, uh, then there's this clip right here of Devin Nunes. And, of course, Devin Nunes 
is going finally <laughs> because Devin Nunes and Trey Gowdy and Jim Jordan and Louis Gohmert and all of these people have seen these documents. Well, a lot of them. I don't know which ones are on which committees, but the ones on the Intel committee have seen these documents. They knew what was in them. They were there for all of these testimonies, so they don't have to read the transcript. They were there. They know what was said. And they've been trying for such a long time to get these out there. In fact, all of these documents were supposed to be released. These transcripts were supposed to be released. They voted to do it in 2018 when Devin Nunes was still the head of the Intel Committee. So what happened? Well, then the Democrats got in power and it was slow walked and they whined and they complained and they said that, you know, it was Trump's fault because the White House was keeping them from doing it. Well, we'll talk about that in just a minute, but they just whined about it. Let's say it that way. And so Devin Nunes finally is vindicated and all these things that he has wanted to tell people for so long, he can now talk about. And so can Trey Gowdy. I saw an interview with him. I think it was an interview with Martha McCallum. I'm not sure. But um, they're all just finally relieved that they can now talk about these things. Okay. And then, uh, of course, Donald Trump Jr. is in very good spirits about it. And he's very happy. And he, and he hopes that Mike Flynn will sue these clowns at the FBI. And I can understand that. Sometimes we conservatives get in a little bubble, just like the liberals do. And we tend to only hear people saying things that are from our perspective. And if you go through and you read some of the comments down below this, you'll see that there's definitely another twist to it, another spin that's going on. Like I showed you on the Twitter trending. Yeah, there's a big spin happening. And they're trying to say that, well, Flynn was guilty and you're just letting him off. That's the whole point of it. So, uh, yeah, it's going to come out. And then this particular person says, well, you know what? We think that uh, all of us digital soldiers humbly request that the first Space Force flagship be named after General Flynn. Thank you in advance for your consideration. I agree with that. Go for it. I would be all for that. Just amazing. That would be wonderful. I think that would be quite appropriate, in my opinion. So if you're on Twitter, maybe you can, I don't know, maybe we need to make some kind of hashtag or something for that, make a trend, and that would be really great. Well, anyway, when I was looking for the Van Grack thing, trying to find out about him resigning and what that particular code was, I came across, you know, the District of Columbia U.S. District Court. Well, uh, on this site, when you do a search, it's kind of interesting. You can go through and you can see several things here. What I thought was really interesting is there's excerpts of unsealed cases and there's Gitmo opinions. But when I went to the Gitmo opinions, the most recent one was like 2014 and Gitmo schedule. Um, then down here, it had unsealed documents in sealed cases and unsealed opinions in sealed cases. So I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. Let's find out about that. See, this is why, you know, I do these squirrel moments. Ra following rabbit trails is what I'm really doing here. But it just is my interest, and I like looking at things. Well, when I got here, the grand jury information that they have here, from 2020, there was one, and 2019, there's 12. I haven't looked at the 2019 ones, but I found this one in 2020 kind of interesting. Now, a lot of it's redacted, that's for sure. But basically what this is, a petition by a grand jury witness to get a copy of their testimony to use um, for other purposes. So here's what it says. A witness who testified under a grant of immunity before the grand jury in this district on four separate days in February and March 2018 in connection with the investigation conducted by special counsel Robert S. Mueller III, the special counsel has petitioned pursuant to federal rule of criminal procedure, yeah, whatever, to obtain copies of transcripts and any audio recordings of his grand jury testimony. Okay, so 
it's almost kind of like a, a having clues to figure something out. Who is this person? Well, of course, they don't name the person. In fact, they have down here the footnote. The petitioner is meh, redacted. And so you don't know who the petitioner is, but you do know some information. First of all, they got a grant of immunity. Hmm. And it was with the Mueller thing. Now, remember, we know that Mueller knew that what he was doing was bogus in the first place. So you got to kind of wonder who it was. And they got this grant of immunity. And it's a he. We know that because the word he is used throughout this, the pronoun. Okay. So when it went through, and it essentially, like I said, for the reasons explained below, the petition is granted and the government is ordered to disclose promptly to the petitioner a copy of the transcript of his grand jury testimony. So they did rule for the petitioner. Let me go here because um, this will give us a little more information. On page 18 of this, uh, when it goes down here, you know, because they do a lot of, in this case, and in this case, yeah, I skipped over most of that. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know the cases, so it doesn't make as much sense. And it really was not going to give me more information about the person themselves. But anyway, uh, they give all the reasons why they need to have their own testimony. Well, basically, Finally, the government claims that the petitioner's testimony is particularly sensitive because it includes questions regarding ongoing investigations and therefore could be used by third parties to assess what the government is investigating or why. Hmm, very interesting. So yes, there are ongoing investigations that the government is investigating in D.C., Gee, I wonder what those could be, right? And if you look up here at the top, this was filed for 120. This was just filed. So there are still ongoing investigations that the government's doing. Okay, this can't be Robert Mueller. His stuff's all done. So this has to be something that is not Mueller and it's still happening now. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And like I said, there's just a bunch of little clues I was trying to piece together and figure out who, what, where, when. <laughs> but anyway, if you go on, it says um, this argument appears to pertain more directly to the petitioner's testimony. But again, the government fails to address the specific circumstances of the case. The government does not explain, for example, how a third party eager to assess what the government is investigating or why, could gain such knowledge from the petitioner while the petitioner is in jail. So whoever this person is, they are in jail. Okay, it is a man, he is in jail, and he has some kind of immunity deal that Mueller gave him. Hmm. And whatever testimony he has given is still being used with the grand jury right now for an ongoing investigation. Huh, I'm kind of wondering if it's Wiener, but uh, wasn't he released or something? I don't know. Anyway, uh, instead, the government again resorts to hypothetical speculation regarding a witness, not this witness. And so they were actually asking, um, the government was trying to say that there was a, a possible witness protection issue here with the person. I don't remember where it said that, but some place it did. So they were worried about this person possibly being in trouble for giving their testimony, which then made me think of Hillary Clinton. <laughs> is it somebody that is going to testify against her? Because, you know, somehow just they seem to just kind of not show up for testimony when it's necessary in court because usually they are no longer breathing. While the government's interest in denying the petitioner a copy of his testimony appear to be minimal, the petitioner's interest in obtaining a copy are clearly pressing. The petitioner is being prosecuted for multiple felony offenses. If convicted, he faces a lengthy prison sentence. Okay, so whoever this is, they're facing multiple felony offenses that may or may not have to do with whatever testimony they gave. 
because I wasn't sure about that as I read through this. I might have to read a little better, but it was kind of like, so is this person going to use this so they don't get convicted of these felonies? I don't think so. I, I'm not sure. But from what I read, it seems like they want their testimony, the copy of it, so it includes what the immunity deal was. So it's very possible that that might keep them from being convicted of these felony offenses. Huh. So I don't know what they are. I don't know who this person is, but I do know that it was somebody that gave his grand jury testimony in connection with the special counsel's investigation. I know that. And it says the petitioner thus needs to review his grand jury testimony to determine the extent to which his immunity will inform his legal defenses at trial. So I guess his lawyers need it to figure out if they can use any of it. And then it goes on and says that it was 900 pages long. The testimony, that's a lot of testimony. <laughs> so now the lawyers were provided with one hard copy of the transcript to review at the U.S. Attorney's Office, limiting review to a single attorney at a time. Well, if you've got 900 pages to review and only one person can be working on it at a time and it has to stay in the U.S. Attorney's Office, could be kind of inconvenient. I can understand that. But given the transcript's length, these restrictions have hindered counsel's ability to review its contents effectively, which that makes sense to me. So I just wanted to share this with you. Again, I have no idea who this is. I don't know what the offenses are, but there was some kind of deal that gave them immunity and they seized his phone. Okay. It was somebody that they seized his phone in connection with the special counsel's investigation. Um, you know, who, who is it? Who is this person? I don't know. So if you're interested in putting puzzles together and picking out clues, go through it and see if you can figure out who it is. I don't know. It's only 22 pages long, so it's not really long, but that's the only part that's unsealed. Okay. Um, and even this, they had a few redactions, not a lot, but a few. So just wanted to show that to you so you could see it. Okay. So let's go to this. And I have no idea why this is all gray. It makes my eyes hurt. So I'm not going to read much of it, but essentially this is a letter from Adam Schiff to Rick Grinnell, okay, who is the acting director of national intelligence right now. And it came out on May 7th, which is when I'm recording this. So it's, you know, just came out today and, oh, wow. Uh, Schiff goes through and pretty much says the same narrative that he's been saying all along. And he wants to know why these transcripts took so long. He's blaming the White House. Well, they weren't supposed to go to the White House because they belong to the committee and they should not be going to the White House for anything. And so that's what he's blaming it on. And he's yelling at Rick Grinnell, I guess, for wanting to release them and then kind of saying that they should have already been released. So it's, it's a little schizophrenic here when you read through it. And so, so that the record is clear, the excessive delay in the ODNI's completion of classification review is the direct result of improper political interference by the White House. <sighs> For over a year, the White House held up the release of the transcripts by insisting on reviewing 11 transcripts for purported White House equities. Well, okay, it wasn't the White House holding them up, all right? It was Dan Coates holding them up, and he was the DNI at the time. And it pains me to say that because the man was our senator from Indiana for quite a while, and I voted for him even. So I was very disappointed that he'd be part of the swamp, but he was, okay? And so, yeah, anyway, they talk about it. And this is just Schiff going on, telling the very same stories, pretty much, and continuing on with the whole Trump-Russia collusion thing. I mean, he just continues on with the same story. It, it's like, have you not been paying attention to anything, but 
you know, the testimony that the committee is releasing today serves as a stark reminder of the ongoing threat that Russian interference poses to our democratic process and specifically to the 2020 election. It is imperative that the intelligence community remain vigilant against this threat, particularly as some individuals in government, wittingly or unwittingly, further the Russian government's interests, including by attempting to whitewash Russia's election interference in 2016, even as Russia seeks to influence the this year's election, political interference has no place in the intelligence community, especially when it comes to the vital mission of protecting the integrity of our elections. Can you say projection? Boy, you know, he's the one that's been meddling. They're the ones that are, are eating away at the integrity of our elections. But anyway, Schiff is, this is like panic. Well, the thing was, Schiff was saying he wasn't going to release them all right away. Well, Grinnell went ahead and released them. And so here are all the transcripts. You can go through and you can read them all. There's like 10,000 pages of, of documents here. So uh, obviously I haven't gone through them all. I haven't gone through any of these yet because there's just so many of them. It's kind of interesting too. There's this one, FBI special agent. These are all alphabetized by the first name. It's really bizarre. So when you try to go through and find them, you can't. This is Schiff's um, list of them right here. It's a little different. It's got the same ones. I mean, it has all of them that are on Grinnell's list, but it has a few others. There's, um, let's see, the Simona Mangiante, Carter Page, because... Yeah, Grinnell didn't release any Carter Page in her transcript. And uh, Eric Prince and Christopher Riley. And then that unredacted was that uh, uh, the FBI agent that it didn't name, which we'll talk about in just a second. Okay, but there are lots of fun things that are going on in the Eric Prince one. There is one on Eric Prince here. And there's also some letters that go with them. Um, these actually are listed by their last names. So Prince would be down here. Uh, it's getting late. Um, there's the Carter page one. So, uh, da, 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 da. Eric Prince. Okay. And I haven't had a chance, like I said, to read any of these yet, but this one right here is the, un the redacted FBI agent. We know that some FBI agent and uh, we don't know who it is. So I'm wondering if maybe this is Pianka here. I don't know. Special agent, whoever. So I don't know if that's long enough for Pianka or not. But anyway, so just something to ponder on that. The information in some of these is kind of eye-opening. Now, I'm going to go through uh, several of these We Are the News links because they were digging and they kind of separated them out and people took different ones. And so this is some of the stuff I've been able to glean from them. You know, I'm going to show you some of the digs they've been doing. First one, this one I just thought was interesting that Atkinson's wife is linked to Fusion GPS. Huh. Who'd have thought? So isn't that interesting? That was one piece of information. There was another one that I picked up that one of the researchers had said has nothing to do with what we're talking about right now. But Diane Feinstein's mother was born in China. Just to let you know. Just thought I'd give you that information. Anyway, uh, then this a researcher was talking about Eric Prince's testimony. He says the single-minded obsession of Schiff's line of questioning during Prince's testimony is with the benefit of hindsight simply staggering. Clearly Schiff was given access to the raw signals intelligence from Crossfire Hurricane at all, or he was given a deep state created narrative and ordered to procure statements that could be held up as evidence to support the Russian narrative or in consolation, a uh, lying to Congress charge, which could then be leveraged by special counsel's office for false testimony against Trump. 
Schiff repeatedly twisted every word uttered by Prince to fit a very specific narrative that Prince was an off-the-books rep of the Trump administration meeting with a Russian asset. So I thought that was just kind of interesting. And then down here he says, much respect to Prince. Beast mode for calling out the whole game right to Schiff's face. <laughs> so, um, you know, again, this was his impression as he read through it. So I thought that would be something you'd like to read. And then this one was about Sean Henry. Now, we've actually talked about Sean Henry before because he was an agent and then he left the FBI or the intelligence community and he went to work for CrowdStrike, I believe, if I remember correctly. And uh, this was something that had to do with the DNC hack and the CrowdStrike story. So... I, I'll leave this down there. Here's the link to that particular document. Um, but of course, it's back here on the main list right here if you want to find it. So it's there. And I just thought this was an interesting one that I'd like to look a little closer at. And yeah, there, there was some in this. Swalwell got a little heated here. He said, a point of order. My understanding is this interview was unclassified. Is that right? Can we just clarify if the witness had classified? My sense is there's some sensitivities around classified information, and this setting is part of the issue. That's just what I'm uh, so. And it just, I don't know, he was complaining about that. So it's always easier when you hear them spoken instead of actually reading them, but all we got is reading them at this point, so we have to kind of interpret what they said and figure out, you know, kind of assume what their tone of voice was. This was another one. The Dems tried to get Corey Lewandowski to disclose POTUS's personal cell phone number. And this is from the March 2018 hearing. The Democrats trying to get Trump's personal cell number. And you got to wonder if Schiff was going to pull his subpoena phone record scam on POTUS like he did Nunes and the others. And Quigley says, going back a minute, you mentioned in your first interview that you normally communicated with the candidate at the time in person or by cell phone. You testified that Mr. Trump at the time used a 212 number during the campaign and you would provide us with that number. Do you have that information today? And Lewandowski says, I do not. Quigley says, is it your intention to produce that? And Lewandowski, he was, he was really sharp on his feet. I remember when he was being interviewed, you know, the public one we got to see. I think if you want the president's cell phone number, you should call the White House. <laughs> oh, that's great. But yeah, why were they trying to get Trump's personal cell phone number? I think that's just fishy, very fishy. And then Jim Jordan was referring to uh, Clapper, and this was something Clapper said, I never saw any direct empirical evidence that the Trump campaign or someone in it was plotting, conspiring with the Russians to meddle with the election. There you go. He said it. So why in the world did we go through everything we went through? Well, we know why. Rice didn't recall intelligence or evidence that POTUS conspired, coordinated, or colluded with Russian government. Ah, how do you like that? And there's her testimony right there. So I don't recall intelligence that I would consider evidence to that effect that I saw prior of conspiracy prior to my departure. So that was, I think it was Gowdy asking. Yeah, Gowdy was asking that. So, yep. <laughs> You know, I, I'm just giving you a lot of these little overviews because that's what they've come up with. And I thought I would share them with you. So on this one, um, this was one of the researchers who said, we really need to get more people to contact their local news, the newspapers and the local state and federal reps and just really start hammering them because we need to make them understand that we're not a minority anymore. We are the majority and we need to make our voices heard. And so I don't know what they've got planned on this because it says more details will come regarding how, but they do give some really good stuff down here at the bottom, you know, some links and, you know, right here, how to correspond with senators. And, but then down here, 
sample letter to representatives, senators, or committee chairs, and you've got a sample there, and then um, tools that we can use, send letter to the editor, newspapers, your state, and writing tips down here, how to write letters to editors. So those are some examples and things. I just thought that was very helpful. Op-ed, um, just some writing tips from Duke University, writing effective op-eds. Because really, a lot of local newspapers will print things if you provide them to them. Because newspapers, well, newspapers are in constant need of content. And one of the best ways, especially if you're a budding writer and you want to get started, get your foot in the door, write some op-eds, write some things for your local newspaper. And who knows, maybe you can graduate to a little bit bigger paper and then have even bigger papers than that. That's kind of where you start. And it's a lot easier usually getting things published in local newspapers because as I said, they are in desperate need of content. If you think about how many different articles and things they have in their newspaper every day, it's a lot of content. And, you know, it takes a long time to gather all that together to make sure it's edited and to put it together in a newspaper and then print it and deliver it. So they're constantly looking for writers who can give them some content. And if you can do it well, then that's, you know, what they're going to be looking for. I suggest you try it and get some information out there. My suggestion, especially if you follow the 17th letter of the alphabet, don't mention him because it's not about him. And the minute they see that, they will probably turn off. What you do is you talk about all the things that he's told us, all the things we know from that. And remember, you got to stick to documented stuff, things that are already out there in the public so people can verify it for themselves. If you talk about things that are suppositions or some of the things that are not necessarily documented yet, um, stay away from some of the harder stuff at this point. That'll come next. Right now, we need to be focusing on what's happening in our country. We need to tell people about Mike Flynn. We need to tell people why he was put in the position he was. And, you know, I heard on our radio, local radio station today, the guy was talking about him. And in his opinion, he thinks it's Mueller who targeted Flynn. Well, I'm sure Mueller was part of that, but he wasn't the main person. Obama was the one that had the vendetta against Flynn because Flynn was stopping all the Muslim invasion of our government. So, um, you know, little things like that. Try to phone in and talk to him. I didn't call him, but I did get a chance to send in a little text message and kind of told him a little differently. He didn't read that one on the air, though. I don't think he believed me. But he was also talking today about the FBI and nobody had been fired. And I said, what do you mean nobody's been fired? Like the whole seventh floor was fired. Almost. Just about everybody. So anyway, I'll leave the link to this down below. Lots of good stuff in here. And uh, we definitely need to make sure that we're getting our voice out there because people need to hear it. I like what he says here. Do not limit your op-ed to print outlets. Reach out to bloggers and YouTubers and all different kinds of people. When you're posting comments on different YouTube channels, when you're uh, posting in on Twitter, when you're posting in social media, it does make a difference. I had to kind of step back from Facebook for a while because I just couldn't do everything and Twitter was taking up the majority of my time and just because I kind of had to to keep up with all the news. And so I've been trying to get back into Facebook a little bit more and my friends are going, I'm glad you're back because there's so much that's going on in our news and I want to know what your opinion is on it. So don't be afraid to give your opinion to let people know what you know because chances are you know a little bit more about what's going on in our government right now than the average person. This was one that kind of caught me by surprise. Evidently, now Benny G. Thompson, he's a Democrat, of course, because this is the Homeland Democrats here. And he released a statement on efforts to move the Secret Service 
from Homeland Security to the Treasury. And I thought, well, that's kind of odd. Here's the Hill article about it. And evidently, this is a bipartisan thing because Graham and Feinstein offer Bill to move Secret Service back to Treasury. And it appears that this is what Trump is going to want. The bill is in line with President Trump's proposal in his 2021 budget to move the agency back to the Department of Treasury from the Department of Homeland Security. Okay, I have no idea why that might be. It kind of astonished me when I found out that the Secret Service started out as its primary responsibility was dealing with currency forgery. So kind of strange. I mean, right now, as far as I know, their primary responsibility is protecting the president and the vice president and other big name people. <laughs> so um, I don't know. I guess the, this was a little bit of history I didn't know about. So now I know about it and they're talking about moving them back. I don't know. In my mind, they seem to fit pretty well in Department of Homeland Security, but that's just in my mind, I guess. I don't know. But anyway, that's what I've got for you on this one. All the links will be down below in the description if I can fit them all in there. So anyway, thanks for stopping by and I'll see y'all later. Bye.